Hi there, everybody. Professor Tomney here, and I am back with a new series today for biochemistry. So we're going to start taking a look into some of the concepts behind biochemistry and the chemical mechanisms and machinery that drive the larger biological systems. So this is really the first offering in this course that I have uh, that I'm going to be making available here on YouTube. So I don't really want to call it introduction to biochemistry. We're going to focus on the chemistry behind biomolecules, which is kind of an intro. And then we will take it from there and start connecting some of those pieces. So get ready for the very first Chem Complete biochemistry video coming up right now. Okay, so before you get too far deep into this lecture, I just want to give a bit of a warning, which is that if you are going to engage with biochemistry content, you need to have a thorough background in organic chemistry. So if you have only taken general chemistry uh, or inorganic and you haven't really been exposed to organic, you need to make sure that that's under your belt first. Now, you by no means need to know all of organic chemistry but a good portion of it because organic chemistry is going to be involved in all of the biological machinery that we take a look at in this lecture. Organic chemistry is kind of a prelude to all of this. So you definitely want to be comfortable with functional groups, resonance, um, aromaticity, things like that. And then there are still general chemistry concepts that are going to layer into this. And you're going to see one of the first ones that's going to come up is going to be intermolecular forces, which is really going to be kind of the topic of our next video is intermolecular forces and a review of those in relation to biomolecules. Okay. So to start out, let's take a brief moment to consider this. What makes up a living system? So there's a lot of different answers that I get when I ask this to students. So one of the most common answers is atoms, and that's not incorrect. All living systems would be made up of atoms because we're technically talking about matter and the atom, generally speaking, if we're not looking at the subatomic particles, is going to be the simplest form of matter that we can kind of deconstruct to on a regular basis. But go a little bit higher up. So if you're in bio 101, before you're ever really exposed to a whole lot of chemistry, what is the basic unit that makes up a living system or the basic building block? And I think that most students know the answer to that is cells. Okay, so cells are going to be kind of the upper level of that basic hierarchy for living systems. Now, we can certainly break this down further. We were just talking about atoms. So what are the different components that we utilize when we talk about a cell's makeup? And those components are what we refer to as organelles. So organelles are going to be the tiny little structures that comprise the cell. And if you look at the organelles, they are made up of organic compounds, very often repeating organic type of polymers or things like that. Okay, and so examples of the organelles would be things like a mitochondria, a Golgi body, an endoplasmic reticulum. So if you're dusty on some of your biology, you may need to kind of work on that as well as far as the discussion is concerned, right? But if we break those organelles down and we continue our flow chart here, organelles can really be broken down into what we refer to as macro molecules. Okay, and some of the macro molecule terms, you may have heard of macros when you're talking about dietary stuff. People say, oh, I got to watch my macros, my proteins, my fats, my carbohydrates. Well, those food macros that we eat are derived from the fact that those are the materials that the cells in our body need, right? We eat to preserve ourselves and to rebuild parts of cells that need uh, reconstruction or to give birth to new cells. And then we also, for energy purposes, right, the production of ATP, we also have to consume this. So as far as macromolecules are concerned and then organelles in the cellular level, there's really three major ones. Now there is a fourth one, and I'll mention in a second why I'm not kind of listing it here, but the three major macromolecules that we usually start discussing when we discuss living systems at the cellular level. The first one is going to be nucleic acids, right? So this is the Na in DNA and RNA. Your nucleic acids are primarily going to be the 
harbingers of the genetic material or information that is the blueprint of the cell. So it tells the cell, hey, these are what all the different organelles do. This is how you make copies of yourself, right? All of that stuff. Then you've got lipids. So lipids, which is a scientific word for fats, are going to primarily be involved with structure and support of the cell. Now, lipids also make fantastic energy sources, right? If you even look at the calories, carbohydrates and proteins have four calories per gram, whereas lipids have nine. And in fact, the body is so interested in the energy preservation that if you look at metabolism and most of the carbs and other things that come into the system, inevitably it's stored as fat, right? And that's why we know if people eat too much, they usually get a fat surplus. And if they're not eating enough, some of that fat diminishes, but we can see on the physical body. And we can also see at the cellular level, if you start talking about things like adipose tissue, that lipids are good for storing energy, but they don't just serve that purpose alone. Lipids are also very important in cell membrane structures. So we're going to talk about later down the line lipid bilayers and sort of the hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions that are going to take place due to some of the lipid setup and the way that it will uh, drive biological systems. Okay, and then the last one that I have here is proteins. So proteins are going to be used in the expression of genes. They are also going to be just very important building blocks when you start creating the organelles themselves. So as you are continuously building these pieces to the cell, the proteins are really reserved for structure, a lot more so than energy. So, you know, people, you can use protein for energy, but the body would prefer not do that only if it's in a pinch because protein is very costly to break down and then to utilize for energy purposes. It's better reserved as material for building up at the cellular level and for gene expression as needed. Okay, so the last one that isn't mentioned here is carbohydrates. Now, carbohydrates are important. Carbohydrates are primarily going to be energy or fuel reserves okay and i even hesitate to say reserves because they don't get stored very long term there is glycogen in muscles um but glucose itself like the actual sugar that you would have in your blood is not able to go into high elevated levels so when you eat and your blood sugar spikes that's the role of the pancreas to send out insulin and the insulin has to kind of shuttle that sugar into a usable, stable form. So some of it gets used immediately, if possible. And then any excess that is not needed would get converted into uh, fats and triglycerides and then could be stored for later use if the host needed uh, to tap into some energy. Okay, so those are the main ones. We will focus on this channel on carbohydrates at some point, but these are the three major ones when we're talking about cellular structure, right? Whereas the other one's kind of the energy source that a lot of these cells use. So let's take a look at some of the organic chemistry behind some of this. So amino acids, there's going to be 20 essential uh, main amino acids that are more common than the uh, sort of the rare ones. So something like taurine, uh, is not considered one of the main 20. Okay, one of the ones that is one of the main 20 is aspartic acid. Now, the thing with the amino acids is that they have side chains. So they share a general similar structure, and that structure looks like this. Now, the ions that you see here, so the charges, may be present or may be absent depending on the pH level you find this amino acid at. Okay, so you've got the hydrogen here. And then you have a carboxylic acid group here. So we're just going to abbreviate that as the COOH. Okay. And then for the aspartic acid, this is where you would have the side chain. So a lot of times in organic chemistry, we write R if we're talking about a generalized component. Okay. Well, the R's are specific for each amino acid. So for aspartic acid, we would have a CH2 group. And then we would have another carboxylic acid. So we'll kind of draw it out a little this time. Right? Like that. So that is aspartic acid. And all 20 amino acids are relatively similar to this, where they're going to have this primary component right here, and then they'll have some sort of a unique side chain there. And those 20 common ones, which we'll talk about in a separate lecture, are going to be a large chunk of what you need when you are doing any type of organelle, uh, you know, development or uh, synthesis or things of that nature, right? Protein synthesis. So 
the nucleic acids, those are the little chunks that come from the DNA and the RNA, the genetic code. As far as nucleic acids are concerned, we'll go ahead and we'll take a look. You can have uh, single ringed ones and double ringed ones, the purines and the pyridines, pyrimidines, excuse me. And for the nucleic acid that we'll take a look at, let's take a look at cytidine. Okay, so these are aromatic systems, and the aromatic system is usually going to have these uh, carbonyl groups, uh, so C double bond O groups, and then they usually have some nitrogens that are present within the ring. We call these heteroatoms uh, when they're stuck inside of the ring like that, so a heteronitrogen, a heterooxygen. Okay, so NH2, you'd have a carbonyl here. And then this nitrogen is the point of attachment. Now this is going to actually be a carbohydrate, the ribose here in the uh, RNA, DNA, right? Deoxyribose or ribose. And then you have to look at the way that the attachments occur to the base, which is that part that we've got up there and the actual sugar component itself. Okay, so right here, that would be the site of attachment. You'd have an H here, okay? And we would have H and OH. We would have an H and an OH. Okay, so a lot of organic chemistry. Again, you need to also be comfortable seeing ring structures and reading the carbon content that would be present there, right? Okay, and then that would be H. So you can also see uh, the capability here. A lot of these compounds have, right, polar uh, chunks to them that could get involved in hydrogen bonding or other intermolecular forces. And that's exactly how some of these things are gonna to stick together, right? So you think about the DNA, the double helix, and these little pieces that come and they stick together. It is the hydrogen bonding in these interactions between those polar functional groups that make that possible, okay? And so then for lipids, okay, lipids are a large class of compounds and you generally have very long hydrocarbon chains. Lipids are relatively nonpolar. They may have certain small sections that are more polar than others, but overall they are nonpolar and the length of the chain will depend on how nonpolar they are or how nonpolar they are will depend on the length of the chain is probably the better way to put that. Okay, so a common one that's uh, well known is steric acid. Steric acid is a saturated fat, so we're also, when we talk about lipids, we have to talk about polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, which just talks about are there any double bonds present, okay? So steric acid is saturated, there are no double bonds present. You've got CH3, and then you would have a total of 16 methylene groups, CH2 groups, and then you would have your C double bond O, OH, Okay, so a lot of these end in carboxylic acids here, and those carboxylic acids, again, depending on the pH conditions, could be deprotonated uh, based on how basic or acidic those conditions may be, okay? So if we take a look at all of these compounds that we have up here, and we say, what do they have in common? I think that the obvious answer should be evident by now, and that correct answer is that they all contain carbon, right? Carbon is the driver, the focus here, as far as these compounds are concerned. So all of them are going to be carbon-based compounds. Now, some of them have oxygens, some of them have nitrogens, right? Lots of them have hydrocarbons, hydrogens with the carbons, but they all have carbon somewhere, okay? Now, if we take a look at this, one of the questions that always comes up after this is why carbon, right? Why is carbon the one that is at the center of all living things? And why is it so unique in biochemistry? And it's really that carbon has the ability, if you take a look at its hybridization process and its Lewis structures, it has the ability to form four bonds. Okay. And because it has the ability to form four sigma bonds, that is going to lead to or equal many diverse structures and possibilities. So if you take a look at kind of the library of different carbon compounds, 
it gets very vast very quickly. Okay, so you have many diverse covalent compounds or structures that can be generated with carbon at the heart. Right? If I was looking at something like hydrogen, well, hydrogen only has one electron, so it can form a bond with one other atom, and that's it. So it's going to be more limited in the number of compounds it can make. And certainly the more bonds you can make, the more diversity you can have in your chemical structures, right? So carbon is so essential because it has the ability to form four bonds, which leads to all of these possible diverse structures that we need in order to sustain life. Okay, so I think that's a good stopping point. What we're really going to take a look at next time is go into a little more detail regarding these structures and what holds them together at the cellular level, which will be a review of intermolecular forces. And then on top of that, we'll tie it in with the biochemistry molecules and kind of see some of those intermolecular forces with one another as they're uh, acting out there. So Head on over to chemcomplete.com. You can always show your support by hitting the thanks button on YouTube, which we now have active on the channel. And as always, the biggest form of support is subscribing and choosing ChemComplete for all of your learning needs. So I hope that this introduction to biochemistry was useful, and I will see you guys in the next one.